The human eye's dynamic range is incredible, being able to detect a single photon of light or 10 billion. The human ear contains as many circuits as a telephone system of a large city. A king of Israel named Solomon wrote that the hearing ear and the seeing eye were both made by God. However, are we to believe him? Can we trust the Bible, especially since it's supposedly full of contradictions? It's my case that the Christian faith is not blind, so please listen with your ears, eyes, and heart open as this episode of Skeptic of Doubt covers the importance of names in contradictions. Forensic science is the use of scientific methods or expertise to investigate crimes or examine evidence that might be presented in a court of law. Although I doubt you need a degree in forensic science to crack this case. In the year of our Lord, 2016, there was an Arizona man by the name of Alberto Lopez. He was a bank employee, or should I say a former bank employee, as he was suspected of stealing $5,000 from the bank in a three month time. The bank reported him to the authorities. However, he decided at the time that banking was not for him and he went into hiding in Phoenix. Fast forward two years later to the year of our Lord 2018, Alberto was looking for work. The light bulb went off in his head and he had a brilliant idea. What if he worked as a dispatcher for the local police department? He sent his application in and the police decided to give him a job interview. To his surprise, though he had shown up in a suit fully prepared for his job interview, the police recognized his name on his application and arrested him on the spot. I guess that is to be expected when you're a criminal who applies for a job with the police. Besides not stealing money from our employers, another lesson that we can glean from this cautionary tale is that names are recognizable and are useful for identifying people and distinguishing people, places, and things from one another. In fact, alleged name-related discrepancies hold the key to resolving several supposed contradictions in the Bible. Take for instance the purported contradiction about the identity of Moses' father-in-law. Skeptics of the Bible say that verses like Exodus chapter 18 verse 1 claim that Moses' father-in-law was named Jethro. The text reads, when Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law. This is the name that most Christians use to refer to Moses' father-in-law. However, reasons the skeptic, later on the Torah calls Moses' father-in-law Hobab. Numbers 10.29 states, And Moses said unto Hobab, the son of Regul, the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law. Even worse, continues the skeptic, earlier in the book of Exodus, Moses' father-in-law is called Reuel. Moses had saved Reuel's daughters, and Reuel gave Moses his daughter Zipporah's hand in marriage. So, who's Moses' father-in-law? Reuel, Jethro, or Hobab? This objection is an example of the fallacy of the false dilemma, because Moses' father-in-law went by several names. It was not uncommon at all for people in the Old and New Testament to be referred to with multiple names, like Jacob was also known as Israel, and Simon was also known as Peter. I believe Moses' father-in-law must have had a sense of pride and joy to see that his daughter not only married a man of God, but a man whom God considered to be a friend. Moses and his brother Aaron 
both work tirelessly to serve as faithful leaders of God's people. Speaking of the brother of Moses, the place of Aaron's death is another alleged Bible contradiction. Skeptics of the Bible say that in Numbers, it said that Aaron died on Mount Hor. However, the very next book in the Torah, Deuteronomy, claims that Aaron died in the region of Mozera. Numbers 33:38 plainly reads, And Aaron the priest went up into Mount Hor at the commandment of the Lord and died there. Deuteronomy 10:6 reads, And the children of Israel took their journey from Beeroth of the children of Jachin to Mosera. There Aaron died. So which is it? Did Aaron die at Mount Or or Mosera? As with our last example, this is another false dilemma, which is easily resolved when you do a little digging into the geography of Israel. For Mount Or is in the region of Mosera. So these verses are not in contradiction. In another sense, this is also akin or analogous to a subset fallacy. It would not be contradictory for me to say, I visited Tennessee last weekend to one friend and I visited Nashville to another because Nashville is the capital of Tennessee. It's a subset or a part of Tennessee. Speaking of capitals, King Saul and King David both ruled over Israel. However, is it possible that there was an individual in their reigns who was both the father and the son of an individual? This brings us to our second supposed Bible contradiction in this section in the Old Testament. Skeptics say that the Bible claims that Abathar was both the father and the son of Ahimelech. 1 Samuel 23.6 reads, And it came to pass when Abathar, the son of Ahimelech, fled to David, to Kelia, that he came down with an ephod in his hand. So this verse pretty clearly indicates that Abathar was the son of Ahimelech. However, when you take a look at what the Bible says in 2 Samuel 8 verse 17, you'll see that it says in Zadok, the son of Atatub, and Ahimelech, the son of Abathar, were the priests, and Zariah was the scribe, indicating that Abathar was the father of Ahimelech. So is Abathar the father or the son of Ahimelech? This supposed contradiction is an example of improper textual analysis and the fallacy of equivocation, as these two usages of Ahimelech are two completely different senses as these texts refer to two different people who lived at different times. One Ahimelech lived during the reign of King Saul, who martyred him because he refused to acquiesce to the unjust persecution of David. Because Ahimelech refused to turn on David, Saul said to him, Thou shalt surely die, Ahimelech, thou and all thy father's house. However, in the slaughter, Ahimelech's son Abathar was able to escape. The Bible says, And one of the sons of Ahimelech, the son of Atatub, named Abathar, escaped and fled after David. Abathar had made it out alive, and to honor his father's bravery, he named his son after his father. So Abathar had a son named Ahimelech, who eventually served as a priest under King David. And for our final contradiction in this section, we're going to look at another supposed case of mistaken parental identity. Skeptics of the Bible say that 1 Kings and 2 Chronicles offer contradictory information on the identity of Abijam, the grandson of King Solomon's mother. On one hand, the Bible states that King Abijam's mother was named Makkah, as 1 Kings 15 through 2 clearly states, now in the eighteenth year of King Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, reigned Abijam over Judah. Three years reigned he in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Macha, the daughter of Absalom. However, the skeptics state, in contradiction to that, the book of 2 Chronicles 13, 1-2 states, Now in the eighteenth year of King Jeroboam began Abijah to reign over Judah. He reigned three years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Micaiah, the daughter of Uriel of Gibeah. So, reasons the skeptic, who was the mother of Abijam, Makkah or Micaiah? This is another example of a false dilemma, because Makkah and Micaiah are variations of the same name, like Chris and Christopher. Another important principle to keep in mind, which was mentioned in another episode of Skeptic of Doubt, is that some of the practices that we have today like 
having variations of the same name, like John or Jonathan, were practiced in biblical times. As we've seen throughout this episode of Skeptic of Doubt, the names of individuals mentioned in the accounts of the Bible are very important details. Interestingly enough, Revelation 2.17 talks about the overcomers receiving a new name. So indeed, names of individuals mentioned in biblical accounts are details that we need to pay attention to. As with the Old Testament, skeptics allege that the New Testament has several name-related discrepancies that constitute genuine contradiction, and therefore call into question the authenticity of the biblical accounts. Our first contradiction has to do with the names of some of the authors of the New Testament, where, more specifically, we're going to be looking at whether or not the various lists of the names of the Twelve Apostles contradict one another. There are several instances in the New Testament, such as Matthew 10, 2-4, Mark 3, 16-19, Luke 6, 14-16, and Acts 1, where the names of the Twelve Disciples are listed. Part of the confusion comes up because some disciples are referred to in different ways. For simplicity's sake, I'm going to list all the disciples that are referred to by more than one name. Peter, sometimes called Simon, not to be confused with Simon the Canaanite, who's also known as Zealots or the Zealot. There are two disciples named James. One is the son of Zebedee, and the other is James, the son of Alphaeus. And there are also two disciples who are named Judas. The more infamous of the two was Judas Iscariot, as he was the one who betrayed Jesus, and the other was Judas Lebius, also known as Thaddeus. Matthew is also known as Levi. Finally, besides the fact that some of the disciples go by multiple names, people sometimes get confused when they read Acts 1.13 because Judas is omitted here. This is likely because he had betrayed Christ. Speaking of Acts, that book was written by Luke, who, like Matthew, had a genealogy for Christ in his gospel. Skeptics sometimes charge that these two genealogies are wildly inconsistent, with one listing names that the other does not. But this is because Matthew is recording the genealogy of Joseph, and Luke is recording the genealogy of Mary. So in one sense, this objection is another instance of improper genealogical analysis. One would not have reason to suspect that two different genealogies would look exactly the same. So there's no contradiction between Matthew 1 and Luke 3. Indeed, as Matthew and Luke's Gospels record and point out, Christ Jesus came to this earth to seek and to save that which was lost. During his earthly ministry, Christ brought healing and restoration to a great number of people who were afflicted with ailments like blindness. However, Skeptics allege that the accounts of Christ healing the blind are contradictory. For instance, what was the name of the place where Jesus healed the blind man? Mark chapter 8, 22-25 states that the blind man was healed in Bethesda. However, John 8, 59 and John 9, 1-6 state that the blind man was healed at the pool of Siloame. The answer to this contradiction is quite simply that these two accounts were referring to two separate blind men. The account of Mark chronicles a man who was brought to Christ Jesus and healed in the encounter with him. And the account of John records another man being told to wash in the pool of Siloame to receive his sight. Again, while this contradiction was formulated on the basis of an alleged name discrepancy, the names of the locations ended up being irrelevant as to whether or not these accounts were contradictory because they are accounts of two different blind men. That's something I think that we would do well to keep in mind. Sometimes resolving an alleged Bible contradiction really does come down to questioning the question. In this case, because these accounts refer to two different people entirely, the question was invalid from the start. Additionally, when we ask ourselves questions of people who are skeptical of our faith, we need to do our best to make sure that our questions are fair and valid. If you keep in mind the things that we spoke about today, like the fact that naming practices in our modern times are practiced in biblical times, that sometimes 
the names of places can be subsets of one another, and that it's important to question questions, then you should be a skeptic. A skeptic with a new way of looking at doubt. When pressed from all sides with hostile questions about your faith, it might be possible that you may feel doubt. Rather than being ashamed or letting your faith slip away, why not doubt your doubt? Instead of being overwhelmed by doubt, why not question your questions and test your tests? Unbelief should be subject to the same level of scrutiny and investigation that faith is commonly put to. I encourage you to doubt your doubt. Be a skeptic of doubt. And remember the truth saved.